I refuse to tell you how long it took me to make that video. <laughs> Check out Ticket King, everybody. All right, so I want to run through... Uh, well, let me start with this. Uh, first of all, welcome to uh, Packernet and all that good stuff. This is, I think, the first time I'm going to try this. We're going to do a whole episode on YouTube. And if you're listening on the podcast, then just ignore all of this. Um, I want to go through some news and notes before we get to the Packer stuff, but I, I want to preface the plan for today. I, um, I made a YouTube video recently um, kind of talking about Bears fans and some of the nonsense, and um, I mentioned how you know I talked to Zach, great dude, does a good job, didn't mean to make him the bad guy, it just worked out that way, whatever, but... The point is, and I, I even got feedback on YouTube, and it's probably different on YouTube and other places than it is on the podcast, because everybody that listens to the podcast knows I'm the old angry curmudgeon, and that's just what I do. But the the whole thing was like, it was, it was very negative, I was so dark, <laughs> you know? And, and in reality, that that is the case. You know, some people, are, you're just a freaking homer talking about the Bears. Well, yeah, a little bit. But I'm also just a skeptic. I do that to Packer fans all the time, too. It's like, dude, Dontavian Wicks is going to be a one. It's like, yeah, maybe. You know? Uh, Jordan Love. I, I didn't believe Jordan Love till forever. And even now, I'm like, I, I totally believe, like, 75%. The point today is to lean into it a little bit. It's to stop apologizing for being optimistic and um, just be excited. You know what I mean? But anyways, we got uh, news and notes first. This just came up. I wasn't going to talk about this, but we talked about it before. That uh, there was some, I think, class action lawsuit against the NFL for their pricing or whatever. Uh, Ari Miroff says, A federal judge in California has found the NFL liable and ordered it to pay $4 billion in residential class damages and $96 million in commercial class damages in the Sunday ticket case. The NFL is appealing the decision. Now, I don't put a lot of stock into this. Um, some federal judge out in California, which I would assume has some of the more strict kind of whatever, they're, they're going to appeal this and somebody will probably throw it out. But... Um, I just want my stance on this to be crystal clear. This is a disaster. As much as on the surface it might be like, bro, get those Sunday ticket prices down, man. You know what I mean? I'll That'd be great. I would love it. You're talking $4 billion in damages. You know that's getting passed down to the teams too, right? That they're going to have to pay. I mean, it's going to be like COVID all over again where nobody has money and there's going to be a freeze on cap increases and it's just going to be a freaking disaster. I don't want that. So, yeah, count me as all the way out on that one. Um, all right, so moving on to what I was more so planning on. Official trailer of Hard Knocks offseason with the New York Giants just dropped. So I just wanted to uh, remind everybody that we've got this thing coming out. Um, it's not like they're paying me to promote it or whatever, but I, just any offseason content is good content. Um, but this is going to premiere July 2nd. You're going to see episodes airing uh, every Tuesday through July 30th. It's going to cover Joe Schoen and the GM and all that stuff. Um, it is going to be the uh, Scouting Combine Free Agency NFL Draft and Team Minicap. And one of the other things, at the end of this, there is, um, well, let's start with this. This is um, pro football talk. Saquon Barkley claims Giants didn't give him an offer to return. He says, let me educate some of you fans here, Barkley said. I can't bail or become a traitor if I never got an offer to come back. So I went to the organization. I felt that was the best and uh, already being here for a month. I'm excited to be an Eagle. Go Birds. So he says he never got an offer. Now there is a clip that they tease at the end of this in which um, Joe Schoen, the GM, says on the phone, Saquon, can you give me your word on that, or are you not going to give us a chance? Now, we don't have all the context, so maybe there's more to it than that. Uh, it's possible that he was already, you know, in the works with the Eagles or whatever, so it's like he didn't get the contract, he goes to the Eagles, and then they call him in desperation or something. But still, sounds like maybe that wasn't exactly the case. So that would be some, some kind of juicy nonsense, you know what I'm talking about? And then we got this. Uh, Sports Kita. Pro Football tweeted out, 
There have been discussions around the league among certain owners about a separate salary cap for just quarterbacks with the growing contracts. Let me also say that I find this to be, and I don't know all the details, a terrible decision. I can't imagine why anybody would want to do... To me, this is there are like five teams that want this, and nobody else wants it. This is stupid, and it makes absolutely no sense. And from what I understand as of right now, there is really no support for this around the NFL. The, the NFL Players Union is not a fan of it. There's concerns about whether or not that would lead to a separate union for quarterbacks, which would then fragment out to separate players' unions for different individual players. Uh, positions and all that stuff. Let, let me just lay out the most obvious reason why this is stupid. This is going to make it impossible for teams that don't have a quarterback to compete. Plain and simple. It's already impossible for teams that don't have a quarterback to compete. The best teams in the NFL are the teams that have quarterbacks. Pretty much unanimously, with very few exceptions. If you have a separate salary cap for quarterbacks... That means that everybody has a separate salary cap for the rest of their roster. Meaning the Chiefs paying Pat Mahomes and the Jaguars paying Trevor Lawrence and the Packers paying uh, Jordan Love. And don't get me wrong, I'm rooting for this once we pay Jordan Love because it means we're going to dominate everybody. They're not going to have a chance. We all have the same salary cap to build the rest of the roster. Listen, the only way teams that suck can compete is the fact that they're not being weighed down by this ridiculous contract now if it ever got to the point where teams with elite quarterbacks can't compete where the chiefs are just completely ruined because they can't field a football team then you're gonna have to talk about something like that at least to some degree maybe there's like a baseline minimum of of uh cap or or even kind of like you know have the, the the top 53 or the top 51 or whatever you, you could say there's a portion that doesn't count on the salary cap or something i don't know 20 million gets knocked off of there um but the but but as of right now that's not the case the teams with all the quarterbacks are the teams that's winning now you're saying that the chiefs are going to have the exact same budget to build their team as the uh who doesn't have a quarterback right now the 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 pfft, the Vikings, I guess. The Vikings who really don't have a quarterback. So th that's not even a benefit anymore. Like, yeah, but at least we're not paying anybody so we could do this. And, da -da -da -da. and if, you know, if uh, 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 Darnold takes off or, or having a rookie quarterback or whatever, that's a big bet. It's not a benefit anymore. Because you don't have extra money. You have the same amount of money as everybody. That's stupid. That's dumb. It's ridiculous. Again, it... It's the only way that other teams can be competitive. It's a massive handicap to the teams that have the best quarterbacks. And again, I understand if you're the NFL and you're saying, I want to make sure that the teams with the best quarterbacks are the winners. I want the Chiefs to be winning. I want the Bills to be winning. I want the Packers to be winning. Okay, fine. They are. You don't need to make it even easier on them by saying you get a separate salary cap the, the other issue and i don't know how this would work but it seems to me that what you would have to do because there's not just going to be extra money they're not going to say let's just on top of that let's just give them an extra i don't know 50 million dollars for quarterbacks or 55 60 whatever per year however much it, it's going to end up being they're, they're not just going to give extra money to each team which means they're going to cut out of the pool Meaning some teams are going to probably have less salary cap because they have this allotted quarterback money, but they're not going to use it. So essentially their, their stuff just gets thrown in the garbage. It's, it's such a stupid proposal. And even if it's, well, that's not how it's going to work, then at the end of the day, you still have the situation where it's an unbelievably unfair advantage for teams that have really good quarterbacks, which is already an unfair advantage to have a really good quarterback. So the whole thing is absolutely stupid. Um, all right, so that's I think that's it for the uh, non-Packers stuff. A um, couple Packers things that are not a part of what we're doing quite yet today. David Bakhtiari continues his um, assault on turf. He says, some nice fresh grass at AT&T Stadium as they post a... Uh, a uh, picture of a soccer match that took place at AT&T Stadium. 
They put out some nice grass. He says, some nice fresh grass at AT AT&T Stadium. Haters will flood with excuses. But if the owners want to do grass fields, they can get it done, which, of course, is true. We've already talked about that. It seems I went and looked up the data myself. It was kind of conflicting, but it does look like um, there are increased injuries. I know it seems like common sense, but I, I, there was some dispute. There, there's people out there that are like, that's not what the data says. So I just want to go check for myself. And because I'm stupid, I already forgot exactly how that goes. But um, it, it is my recollection. It, it's kind of weird. Like, it's not always the same, and it kind of depends on this, that, or the other. But overall, in the aggregate, I think it does. Um, you do see a pretty uh, steep increase in injuries. But I, I, I partially also point this out because one of the things that we recently talked about with David Bakhtiari is where is he going to end up. And I said, I don't think it's going to be, you know, with the Jets or even with Dallas, which seems like the most obvious decision. He should go to Dallas. You got Mike McCarthy there. They need the help at tackle. It would just be, you know, like a glove. As much as, you know, obviously it'd be great to have him in Green Bay, but that seems to have, that ship has sailed. Um, but I don't know, man. I, it would just be such an odd thing for him to go on these this crusade of, you know, this is the worst possible thing, this is terrible, and then just sign with the team anyways. I mean, it, it, what, it, what it does is it incentivizes teams to not do it, right? If, if David Bakhtiari can officially say, I refuse to play at places like this and try to talk to other people about that as well, that may get teams like Dallas to say, okay, you know what, let's, let's go ahead and do it. But... If he's just going to sign off, then all the talking has been for nothing. So there's that. And then we've got the official training camp schedule here, 2024 training camp schedule. So if you're planning on heading up to Lambeau Field to catch a uh, catch a practice, here is your practice schedule. So um, it starts July 22nd. So we have less than a month, less than a month of time to fill um, to talk about nonsense, to argue about nonsense, uh, and don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm looking forward to it, I'm always down to argue about nonsense, but um, less than a month until we see some, some, I say actual football, but you know what I mean, who's calling me right now? I don't know that number. Um, so we got usually these three-day stretches here, so 22nd, 3rd, and 4th, 26th, 7, 8th, 30th, 31, and then August 1st, so those are your three days, one day break, three days, one day break, three days, one day break. And then family night, Saturday the 3rd. If you have not been to family night, I would encourage you to go check it out. Um, I'm hopeful to get, to get back there sometime for family night. It was a cool experience, but my youngest was, or not my youngest, my youngest at the time, my second youngest now, um, she was an absolute terror. And uh, it was brutal. It was awful. <laughs> it's just... She was a disaster. It's very late, so if you have a, a kid that's a, a problem child, that you know, in the let's talk about terrible twos. It's not terrible twos, dude. I thought maybe it was just one of my kids. It's all of my kids. I have four kids. I can confirm twos are fine. Threes are a problem. Maybe it's something that's evolved with time, with kids not developing or or breaking down as as quickly as they used to. I have no idea. But. Um, we don't have terrible twos. We have three nagers is what we have around here. And my, my youngest is now three, so she's kind of having some issues. But at least I know by four she'll be fine. But if you have a three-year-old, maybe wait a year. I'm just saying. But it is a good time. And then um, you got – that. that's when the, the practices start to slow down a little bit. They get some extra breaks because we got preseason games actually mixed in. And, and some of this stuff, it's not necessarily breaks. It's kind of behind the uh, behind the curtain and whatnot. But you got two days, and then on Saturday you've got the Browns. That's an away game. Then the next week you have two days, uh, and then you have on Sunday the away game against the Broncos. Then you got break, practice, break, joint practice with the Baltimore Ravens. And then uh, the 24th is going to be at home against the Baltimore Ravens. Remember, they kind of alternate between whether you get multiple home games uh, during the season or during um, uh, the preseason. And so the Packers get two home games during the season, so they're going to have two away games. This, In this case, it's going to be the first two against the Browns and the Broncos. So um, that's all of that. What else? Oh, one final thing before we take a break. 
This is uh, some news here from Richard Ryman over at PackersNews.com. Stadium Board agrees to help Green Bay Packers pay for third Lambeau Field locker room. This confused the ever-loving crap out of me. I had no idea why this would be a thing. But essentially, um, the Green Bay Brown County Professional Football Stadium District approved a $2.97 million disbursement to the Green Bay Packers for construction of a third locker room at Lambeau Field. Apparently, the reason that they need to do this is for um, events. So for um, uh, college football games, soccer games, World Cup stuff, uh, whatever kind of things where you would need a locker room. And, and it kind of confused me because it's like, well, we have two. Why do they need more than two? The Packers use their locker room year round. So in the past, when we've done this uh, before, like for the Wisconsin LSU game back in 2016, the um, Green Bay Packers essentially used the away locker room. And then what you can see in this picture here is them setting up a temporary locker room. So they threw up this stuff, threw up some fake lockers, or not fake, they're real. You can use them. It's not digital or anything. But these temporary lockers. Um, and so it's kind of a way to continue doing what they have been doing with Mark Murphy and all that in um, hosting events, right? We got the draft, we got title town, we get we're really building things out. And so one of the inconveniences or hindrances to the Packers being able to host events or at least sporting events is the fact that they don't have a third locker room, which again, I didn't know was a thing. Now we know it's a thing. So uh, 3 million bucks has been approved for the Packers to build out that locker room. All right. That's it for this first segment. Why don't we take a quick break? We'll be back to um, start looking at some hype, a little bit of hype, starting with Jordan Love and then a little bit about the wide receivers. We'll be right back. All right, so this is the uh, Paul Farrington Show. Obviously, we talked about them quite a bit. I'm just using this to kind of kick things off a little bit because it's kind of what kind of triggered it in my mind. Um, the, the main, well, let me just let him do the talking first. And when you take a look over the course of the Packers MVP quarterbacks, all the big ones have done it. Bart Starr did it in 1966. Brett Favre, I actually didn't realize this until the other day I was on his, uh, pro football, what was it, the, uh, pro football data reference, yeah. Uh, three straight MVPs, 1995, 96, 97, and then of course Aaron Rodgers, four MVPs, 2011, 14, 20, 21. Begs the question, if Jordan Love is going to be the next great Packer quarterback, when can we see this jump into you know, elite, elite, elite status? And Brian Gutekunst came out and he said, the sky's the limit for this guy. Offensive coordinator comes out, he says, this night and day from 2023 to 2024. You know, last year, we kind of had to keep a leash on everybody. We weren't sure exactly how, how much of the plays we could run. You weren't sure. You're running new installments, teaching him. And now the scary thing for the NFC North, for us Vikings fans, for the whole league, when you talk about the Packers, is this second-year starter has a year under his belt and confidence. And is all right. I never know when to cut those things off. But look, the uh, the bottom line is is this. I mean, I I feel like it's weird as a Packer fan. I'll speak for myself. I, I'm I'm guessing I'm not alone, but I'll just say for myself as a Packer fan. Having had, I wasn't around for Bart Starr, but Brett Favre and then Aaron Rodgers, who both in their times, for at least a period of time, were considered the best in the entire NFL. Not for their entire careers, but at a period of time. And for most of their careers, if not all their careers, were considered one of the best throughout their entire career. I don't know if we or I was essentially neutered by Pat Mahomes when he came in, and it's just like, nobody will ever be better. He's better than Rodgers. He's the best thing we've ever seen. And so it's like, nobody will ever compete with that. Obviously, he's the best and all that stuff, or what? But why wouldn't we assume that not only is Jordan going to be good, because that's kind of like the question, good, very good, whatever. Why don't we believe he can be the best? Why don't we believe, again... Speaking for myself, why don't I believe, or why why does it feel 
Why do I feel like I'm being a homer if I start talking MVP, if I start talking best in the entire league, better than Mahomes, better than Josh Allen, better than Burrow, better than Lamar, better than whoever it is you like? It shouldn't feel that homerish. It's not like it's never happened before. I mean, look at some of the guys who have been considered MVPs. You're, you're telling me that we can't be competing with guys like Brock Purdy? And it's no disrespect to Brock Purdy, who I thought had a good career, or a, a good season. But if he can do it, why would... I mean, we, we watched an MVP caliber quarterback last year. That's what we watched. So why can't we believe it? Well, I want to lean into it a little bit. Today, we're going to believe... Here is Mina Kimes giving her two cents on Jordan Love in the contract situation and why... You just need to get it done. From Love's perspective, he should obviously try to maximize this for all he's worth. He bet on himself and won. From the Packers' perspective, um, I've seen enough with Jordan Love. Get the deal done and pay what it takes because he's that dude. Uh, second half of the season, he was one of the three best quarterbacks in football. And watching it, it wasn't artificial. It wasn't just schemed up. Although Matt Lafleur is a great play caller, he was making high degree of difficulty throws in clutch situations. I think he has. All of the tools to be one of the five best quarterbacks in the NFL, and I don't think that's hyperbolic, Ryan, based on what I saw last year. No, you asked. Well, and and that's all true. Listen again. I understand there's going to be Bears, Vikings, Lions, and and Forty Niners fans, and everybody else out there going, yeah, 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 bias Packer fan. Whatever. We all watched the guy. As a fan base that watched Aaron Rodgers, I think we have a pretty good gauge of what a really talented quarterback making really good throws looks like. It's why we were able to make fun of the Bears so much with Justin Fields when they put together their highlight reels. It's why we made fun of Tom Brady and his highlight reel, which looked like nothing. <laughs> He's not doing it. He's just throwing to open guys like whoop de doo Like there's no, there's no madness happening here. On top of the fact that, you know, everything she said is true. It's it's this isn't just a scheme thing. This isn't just Matt LaFleur scheming guys open. You're watching a guy do things that you look at and go, that's not normal. There's a difference between being efficient and, and taking what's in front of you and just doing a good job, which is really all I asked for from, from Jordan, to what we saw, which is a next-level guy. And this is also coming from somebody, myself, who said he's either going to be a bust or he's going to be really good. I don't see an in-between. So it shouldn't be that big of a logical leap. This is what Jordan Love is. Now, exactly where it falls on the spectrum, I don't know, but that's the, 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 so who gives a crap? Because nobody is perfectly elite every single year. He's going to have some years that it's like he is the MVP. There's going to be other years where it's like, meh, pretty good. It's, it's, it's Jordan, you know, Jordan's pretty good. Um, but, but as she said, he has all the tools. He does. There are some guys that are just not built that way. They're, they're talented pocket passers with strong arms, and they can do certain things. There are only a small select group that can do what Jordan can do. Period. He has really special talent and potential. Here is um, Mike Tannenbaum, I think, right? Real Tannenbaum? Yeah, Mike Tannenbaum uh, talking about Jordan Love. Outside of Patrick Mahomes, if we, the four of us, were running an NFL team today, there is nobody on the planet I'd rather have than Jordan Love, wow. period, and descends. 25 years old, can make all the throws, Six foot four, high character, high processor, can make people miss. The sky is the limit. If he was an IPO, it'd be like buying the video three years ago. Okay. He is by far to me the player that has the most sustained upside. Do I love Josh Allen? Of course I love Josh Allen. Josh Allen takes a lot of big hits. C.J. Stroud, low C.J. Stroud. Jordan Love's been in the league a little bit longer than C.J. Stroud. There are some other people in that conversation, but when you talk about sustained excellence, to me, it's Jordan Love and then everybody else. Outside of Patrick Mahomes... Well, and, we and we pretty sure we went over that on, uh, on the YouTubes recently, looking at Jordan Love um, starting in week nine. And not even starting in week three, but start, if you start in week nine, when it clicked... He was QB1, maybe QB2, maybe, depending on what specific metric, but highest passing grade was Jordan Love. So to act like that's crazy, and by the way, CJ Stroud is down the list. It's not even like it was, it was neck and neck between Jordan and, and Stroud. It wasn't. It was Jordan and Brock and Dak and Mahomes and 
CJ Stroud was not in that group. CJ Stroud had a good year. He was not as good as Jordan Love. He was not as good. Period. And on top of that, go look at the Texans. Two of the high, he had like two top five wide receivers on his team. If you look at PFF grade, I'm not saying Stroud didn't have a good year and that he's not a good quarterback, but the, the idea that we're just going to do this big eye roll, like, oh, pfft, better than Stroud? I don't think so. I don't think so. Bro, <laughs> Jordan was better. I'm sorry you don't know that. I'm sorry if you don't like the Packers and you don't want to believe that, but that's just the reality. And no, it's not just Matt LaFleur. And guess what? Even if you want to believe that, fine, I'll concede it. You're wrong. Just like you were wrong when you said Matt LaFleur wasn't a good coach. It's really just Aaron Rodgers dragging the team. And now you want to completely flip that on its head because you just refuse to acknowledge anything. You're just making freaking excuses for whatever you want to be true. You're wrong again. But you know what? It doesn't even matter. Fine. It's Matt LaFleur. It's Matt LaFleur doing what? Making Jordan Love the best quarterback in football. So go ahead and have your, your little fake win about he's not actually... The, I don't really care. You're wrong. If you just watch him throw footballs, you can see that. But um, it is what it is. Here is another clip, uh, compliments of our uh, friend Clayton over at Packers Total Access, or Packers underscore Access on the Twitters. It's two and a half minutes long. This is um, Wilde and Tausch having a sit-down with Greg Cosell. More tape than anybody, and you do a great job of illustrating what you see. What did you see from the beginning of the Jordan Love era, which was up and down? What yep. were the biggest reasons we saw him really? I, I'm going to give a take here. I think he was one of the best quarterbacks the back half of last season. What he was able to do, the throws that he made, the consistency that he played with, what was the difference last year? I got I got two answers to that because okay. I, I I actually watched a ton of Jordan Love a couple of weeks ago because that's what I kind of do in the off season. I go back and rewatch a lot of things because during the season I can't watch you know let's say 250 uh, dropbacks in a row you know because I'm going week to week in the off season I can do that. But I, I'm going to start by saying I think Jordan Love is one of the three or four most gifted quarterbacks in the league in terms of pure physical talent. But I think there's two things that really showed up to me, and there may be more, you know, coaches who really, you know, that work with him know him better than I, but just watching the tape, I thought there were two things from a developmental standpoint that stood out. I thought he showed a much better calculated pre-snap understanding, recognizing defenses, understanding how to use his cadence, and I think there was probably no better snapshot of that than the touchdown he threw to Wicks against the Cowboys in the playoff game. I also thought that um, uh, there's another great example of that, too, just understanding what he was looking at pre-snap. He threw a touchdown. I think it might have been, was it week 18? Uh, no, maybe week. It was against the Vikings late in the season. Was that week 17 or somewhere around there? Week 17, that would have been, yeah. Yeah, where um, he threw a touchdown to Reed, and the Vikings changed their coverage. They had late coverage rotation, and he read it instantaneously, and he hit Reed on the seam versus what became cover two. Um, but the second point I wanted to make was he just became a better processor and decision maker from the pocket. He saw things more cleanly. He saw things more quickly. Because um, that's ultimately, you know, what you're trying to do as a quarterback is you're trying to win pre-snap, which is not going to happen all the time. Obviously, there's a defense out there. But you're trying to get as much information as you can pre-snap so that as you're dropping back, because all that happens really fast, as Mark can attest, you're not thinking it through. It just intuitively happens. And he got much better at that. So look, the the whole point of... The, the only real question that needs to be asked is what we saw in the second half of Jordan Love, uh, of the season last year with Jordan Love, is that real? And what you just heard from Greg Cosell, his assessment, is that first half compared to second half, roughly, is Jordan Love when he isn't able to fully process the game pre-post-snap, and then Jordan Love when he is able to process the game pre-post-snap. So what we saw is Jordan Love being Jordan Love, doing Jordan Love things, while also being able to process at a high level. So can he do it? Yes. And what does it look like when Jordan Love is playing with confidence and with the ability to read defenses pre- and post-snap? We saw what it looked like. It looked like from week nine through the end of the season. And what was that? 
maybe the best quarterback in football. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that I know that in 2024 he's going to be the number one quarterback or that he's going to win MVP or any of that, partially because MVP doesn't necessarily correlate to best quarterback, but um, the bottom line is he has the talent, and there's every reason to believe that we've got a guy who is a top five, top three, top two, not two quarterback and will be for the next 10 to 15 years, and with that will very likely come... MVPs, and there's a good chance we'll come with hopefully at least a Super Bowl attached to it. I know the assumption is you got a good quarterback, you win Super Bowls. Unfortunately, there's a lot of good quarterbacks in the NFL, and uh, one of the good quarterbacks keeps winning the Super Bowl every year, which means none of the other ones do. So uh, I'm not making any guarantees with that, but um, yeah, I, I listen. I think there's a lot of smart people looking at this who are saying what and again i'm i'm cautiously pessimistic about stuff i look at it and i go i don't have really a good argument i think it makes the most sense that what we saw from jordan love second half is real and um you know people can argue well he wasn't he wasn't the best quarterback he wasn't the second best he wasn't even say whatever you freaking want just tell me that the second half is real if we can agree to that, then you can call him whatever you want to call him. You can call him the 10th best quarterback if you want to say stupid nonsense. Go ahead. It doesn't matter. Because it's not going to make a difference when Jordan Love and the Green Bay Packers go on to decimate everybody, go to the playoffs every single year. If it makes you feel better to call him the 10th best, it doesn't make a difference. Forgot what I was even talking about. But the bottom line is, I think the Packers... There, There is... Every single reason to believe that Jordan Love is the real deal, and if the rest of the national media doesn't want to recognize that what he was in the second half, which is not a, again, small sample size, three games, four games, five games, no, it wasn't. It was like 12 games from week nine on. And again, you can go to week three, and he was still one of the best quarterbacks in football. In fact, he, he go through the entire season, even with, through eight weeks of him not playing very well. He was still one of the best quarterbacks in football. He's the top 10 quarterback even including his rough games, including the San Francisco 49ers game where he threw the two picks. But I, I think what we have is... I, 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 I would be shocked if we don't see him consistently in the top three. Consistently in the top three. Um... And consistency is going to be the key because we did see some down, uh, some down swings in there. You know, there were a couple games even after Week Nine where it kind of was like, "What the heck was that?" You know, that rough patch where the defense was struggling, but also Jordan was having a rough. I don't know if it was the Giants or Tampa Bay or whatever. He was kind of struggling through that. 49ers game was a dip, obviously. Um, everybody has dips. Pat Mahomes has dips. It's a question of how many. And how low do you go? But but the other the other point is with Jordan Love, the highs are really high, and there's a lot of them. You know, some quarterbacks they'll have one or two games that maybe tick into the nineties. He had what four in in a small window. He had four. Uh, th this guy's going to do some damage, some serious damage. We'll take a break. We'll come back and take a look at um, some some thoughts on the wide receivers as well. All right, let's rip through the wide receivers here real quick, and we'll get out of here. So it starts off with this. PFF put up the top five NFC rec receiving cores going into the 2024 season. Chad Johnson says, so no Bengals? And the uh, respondent down here says, Ocho, it says NFC, calm down. Chad Ocho Cinco says, then the Packers should be there. That's how it started. Then he starts getting ripped up in the comment section because anything positive about the Packers, you don't know football, you don't know this, da 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 uh, th There's just this... It's funny how, how much everybody lags in these things. And I think it's just laziness in part. Um, it's, you know, again, we know basic stats, we know fantasy football, and we know what the television tells me to think. That's about it. And um, people look at the basic stats and they say the Packers... Barely won enough games to get into the playoffs, and then they got beat. And um, Jordan Love, over the course of the season, his statistics were X, Y, Z. And none of the Packers guys are uh, desirable on my fantasy football team. So you must be an idiot, 
Chad Ochocinco. Then we get him responding to Trippin. Not one person in Green Bay has proven. Chad Johnson says, Did you watch effing football last year? The Packers' entire receiving core is the SHIT. Watson, Dobbs, Wicks, and Melton are all proven. The heck are you talking about? Later on, he says, Jaden Reed, son, <laughs> learn the effing name now. Gosh darn it, casual fans. There's a lot of editing going on there trying to figure out how to get that out. So he, he specifically highlights Jaden Reed and how great he is. Here is a podcast. This is um, it's called Pocket Presence. Apparently Kurt Bankert is one of the hosts on the show. I don't know if it's his show or what. But he and Tyler Webb are on here interviewing Hollywood Brown, current NFL wide receiver. Here is a little bit of that exchange. I yeah, that, well, well, it's Hollywood. You Go mentioned ahead. a couple of guys that you receivers will watch and maybe don't, don't get the love publicly. Anybody, Anybody that, that jumps, jumps to mind that fans aren't necessarily putting in their top five list, but you see them and you're like, they deserve more respect. Elijah Moore, Elijah Moore, Cole. He's nice. Okay. <laughs> Situationally <laughs> stuck a little bit. He's, he's crazy nice. Uh, who else can I say? Brian has amazed me. He's so sorry about that. And, and we, we put, put him on the spot, guys. So the, the Packers receiving court, because I'll be, I be messing up their names, but they be cooking. <laughs> they be cooking. Dontavian Wicks. Wicks when I be watching their games, I be like, who, who are them? They, they all going crazy. They all getting open. They all running nice, crisp routes. Uh, Greg Dorch. So, again, right, asking an NFL wide receiver on the spot, who are some guys that are, are good but don't get the recognition? He's got to think about it. He mentions somebody. Then he goes, actually, come to think about it, the Packers receivers, and just lists the whole group, right? Like, you, you're watching it. You're not expecting it. Again, you're not expecting it because nobody's talking about them. And they're all young, and they, they haven't really put their name on the map yet. Um, you turn it on, and you just you don't expect that level of talent coming from this pile of guys that are unknown and by the way you think why do you think chad ochocinco just randomly starts screaming Jaden reed learned the name he just watched him he obviously just watched these i mean I'm, I, I, of course he watched a little bit here and there but he sat down he watched Jaden reed and was like holy crap holy crap that's the point um what else we got here uh here is the final one here this is from PFF, 33rd team, posted this. 2024 difference makers. Green Bay Packers, Jordan Love has been saying, look, they don't have a number one wide receiver. All of their wide receivers are really good. But I think the guy that could actually emerge as their number one wide receiver is Dontavian Wicks. Last season, he was, what, a fifth-round draft pick. He was one of the, the lowest resource-intensive guys on that team. All the resources have been on Christian Watson before that, even, um, you know, the Jaden Reed and, and the tight ends. But Dontavian Wicks has got some real ability about him and emerged as the season wore on. And I think it was kind of forcing his way into that number one conversation. You know, maybe he can't become a Devontae Adams, but could he become, you know, their Greg Jennings, their Jordy Nelson, a, a true number, number one receiver, receiver for them who, who can, can do big things reminds me like he's like a poor man's justin jefferson, jefferson. he's got, got that kind of uh weird running style sort of unusual movement pattern and he was just a playmaker for this team last year so i think wicks is going to continue that ascension and become a real number one receiver for that packers offense and that shows just how deep the packers are because if you ask me who's their best receiver i would probably think about romeo dobbs i would think about christian watson breaking out and you're picking wicks which is fine but, but they're, they're deep, deep. Our receiver, receiver Jaden Reed, who you mentioned. Packers have a lot of options there. All right, let, let me round out with this. So, I mean, first of all, he's exactly right. You can you can have varying um, answers to that question. I, I I don't think a lot of people close to the team would say Dobbs, although, again, that's not necessarily fair because he was the number one wide receiver. Um, Wicks is a popular pick. Reed is a popular pick. Watson is maybe not a super popular pick, but it's maybe my pick. Um, but then, as I said before, the guy that everybody's forgetting about that has the potential to be a real premier receiver on this team, even if the stats aren't there, if you, if you look at, for example, PFF grade, the most 
talented, the guy that's doing all the right things the most, Luke Musgrave. And you can say Kraft or whatever if you want. I, I really think Musgrave has the potential to be a super special talent. Now, not all of these are going to go that way. I'm not going to sit here and, and massively over-homer it up and say, you know, Wicks is going to be elite, and Musgrave is going to be elite, and Kraft is going to be elite, and Reed is going to be elite, and Watson's going to be elite. I'm not, I'm not doing that. What I am saying, though, is that these guys are massively underrated. You have an incredibly gifted play caller in Matt LaFleur. You've got Jordan Love, who's playing like a top five, I'm being generous here, top five quarterback. And then you have guys, and you, you say things like, oh, you got a pile of twos. That that may be fair to some degree, but but don't underestimate, first of all, how talented some twos are in the league, right? If you have two twos or three twos or four twos, that's that's really not a terrible situation to be in. But what I'm also saying is I think we might actually be talking about maybe some low end number number one wide receivers, right? If if we if we extend out the definition of a number one, you know, not talking about the top ten guys, we're talking let's say top thirty two. We might have some top twenty, top twenty five, top thirty two receivers on this team. I think Wicks, I think Reed, I think Watson, I think maybe Dobbs. I, um. You know, Musgrave isn't a receiver, but I think grade-wise he could probably fit in there. I'm not saying they all will, but I'm, I, I don't think there's a single guy that you, if you were to say which one will not be and probably cannot be a top 32 receiver, I'm not picking anybody. I'm not. Maybe Bo Melton is the one that I'm, I'm the most out on that I think a lot of fans are, are really high on. Um, and I could even be wrong about that. I don't know. But um, no, I, I I think I think that we witnessed the 2008 Packers, and we're about to go into the 2009 Packers season. And I think this is going to be the coming out year for the Green Bay Packers. Is what it's going to be. And don't I don't need Bears fans clipping that <laughs> and making that into something that it's not. No, but I I think this is a breakout year for the Packers. And that's not even to say necessarily that a lot of people are so much better. I just think if you have a full season, not a half a season, a full season of Jordan Love playing like he did last year, a full season, which we pretty much had, but we didn't use him as much because we didn't know how good he was, of Wicks. If we have a full healthy season of Christian Watson, he's already a pretty elite talent. He just can't stay on the field. A full season or close to it of Christian Watson. If we can get Reed humming the way he was for a full season, if we can get Musgrave going the way he was for a full season or close to it, if we can get Kraft and we can get the running backs, if we get all these things going starting in week one through the end of the season, I don't think we're going to end this. I don't think next year at this time anybody's going to be talking about anything other than this Packers team is one of the scariest offenses in football, if not the best offense in football. That's where I stand on it. It's not going to be a question. The only real question st sitting here today is where does the defense rank? Is this going to be like the 2011 Packers, where you've got this top-end, high-octane offense, but an, a, a defense that's just dragging the team down? Or are they finally going to figure out this defensive side of things finally get that going and actually start to look like, you know, the 96, 97 Packers, the 2010 Packers, a, a, a team that has a really scary offense led by a premier quarterback and a solid complementary defense. That's not the case in the 90s. That was a elite defense. But at the very least, we're talking a top 10 style defense, which I think is necessary if this team is going to go on to win a Super Bowl one of these days. I'm not blaming the defense necessarily for what happened last time. A lot of offensive pieces didn't get the job done. But I just think it's necessary that we have that complementary offensive and defensive piece. I think by the offense feeling like it needs to shoulder more, you start to see more heroic stuff. You see Jordan Love, you know, late and across the middle type stuff. Um, so... Anyways, that's it. I'm going to leave it at that. You guys have a good rest of your day. I will talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye-bye.